Oogenesis is the production of an ovum, or egg cell. It starts with the development of primary oocytes, which occurs at the fetal stage. From birth, a woman already has all her primary oocytes. These primary oocytes halt in prophase I of meiosis and remain that way until puberty. After menarche, the first occurrence of menstruation, a few of these primary oocytes will continue development with each menstrual cycle. The menstrual cycle can be described via the ovarian and uterine cycles. The ovarian cycle describes changes occurring in follicles of the ovary and consists of the follicular, or proliferation phase, ovulation, and the luteal, or secretory phase, whereas the uterine cycle follows changes in the endometrial lining of the uterus and is divided into menstruation, the proliferation phase, and the secretory phase. Let's discuss the ovarian cycle first. During the follicular phase, ovarian follicles mature and ready an egg for release. Ovulation is the release of this egg. Finally, the luteal phase involves the formation of the corpus luteum and either pregnancy or luteolysis, degradation of the corpus luteum. This cycle is controlled by the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, or HPG axis. The hypothalamus produces gonadotropin-releasing hormone, or GnRH, and this is the key regulator of the cycle. This hormone is released into the hypophyseal portal system, which are capillaries in the infundibulum linking the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary. This portal system allows hypothalamic hormones to reach the pituitary without first entering general circulation. There are two modes of GnRH release, a pulsatile mode and a surge mode which occurs pre-ovulation, with GnRH being persistently present in portal circulation. The pattern of GnRH pulses stimulates release of the gonadotropin's luteinizing hormone, or LH, and follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH, from endocrine cells of the anterior pituitary. LH and FSH travel through the bloodstream and reach the gonads, the ovaries in females. Before we get into changes in hormone levels driving the menstrual cycle, let's discuss folliculogenesis. Folliculogenesis is the maturation process of an ovarian follicle, a structure containing the oocyte and its supporting cells. Again, a woman is born with all her primary oocytes, and those not developing are called primordial follicles. Development of these primordial follicles into mature follicles is a continuous process, and at any time the ovary has follicles in many stages of development. The complete folliculogenesis process for a follicle can take almost a year, and the vast majority of follicles die before completing development. The initial development of follicles is not dependent on gonadotropins, so it can occur at any point during the woman's cycle. Now for the gonadotropin-dependent part. During the first part of the follicular phase, FSH is rising. We'll get to why soon. Anyway, this leads to recruitment of a cohort of follicles from a pool of non-proliferating follicles. This happens on days 1 to 4 of the menstrual cycle, and FSH acts as an important survival factor, preventing these follicles from apoptosis. Over the next three days or so, a selection process occurs under the influence of several hormones, resulting in one dominant follicle surviving, while the others undergo atresia. By day 7 or 8, this dominant follicle is promoting its own growth and suppressing the maturation of other follicles. The day before ovulation, meiosis I resumes, thanks to stimulation by a surge of LH. Once completed, the follicle contains a secondary oocyte, the first polar body is now released. This serves to discard a haploid set of chromosomes. The secondary oocyte, which is haploid, now begins meiosis II, halting at metaphase stage II until fertilization. At this stage, it becomes what's known as a graphene follicle. Should the egg be fertilized, a second polar body will be released. Now, let's look at how hormone levels change during the follicular phase. The follicular phase starts on day one of the menstrual cycle. At this point, FSH is on the rise, since it is no longer inhibited by estrogen and progesterone, which were being produced by the corpus luteum from the previous menstrual cycle until it degraded. Secondarily, FSH is also increasing because the decrease in estrogen and progesterone causes an increase in GnRH pulsatile secretion. Now, FSH isn't called follicle-stimulating hormone for nothing. It stimulates follicular recruitment and maturation. However, the dominant follicle secretes estrogen in increasing amounts. The follicle has granulosa and theca cells surrounding the oocyte. These cells cooperate to produce estrogen. First, 
LH stimulates DECA cells to produce androgens. The androgens then get converted to estrogen in granulosa cells by the enzyme aromatase in response to signals from FSH. Estrogen levels rise as the follicle matures because there are more and more granulosa cells, though the amount of estrogen produced by each granulosa cell remains the same. This estrogen inhibits production of FSH, and it stimulates the development of the endometrium. Less FSH means a more androgenic microenvironment within follicles adjacent to the dominant one. The estrogen also maintains rapid GnRH pulsatility in the late follicular phase. This rapid and persistent GnRH pulsation increases LH production, which stimulates yet more estrogen production. Interestingly, the low estrogen levels at the start of the follicular phase inhibit the production of LH. However, high levels of estrogen present at the end of the follicular phase stimulate the production of LH. As a result, you get what's called a surge of LH starting around day 12, and this surge can last 48 hours. FSH also has a small surge as a side effect. GnRH stays elevated, though, until there is desensitization in the LH-producing gonadotropic cells in the anterior pituitary. Estrogen levels drop rapidly immediately before LH peaks, possibly due to LH downregulation of its own receptor, or because of direct inhibition of estrogen synthesis by progesterone. LH then drops again. The drop of LH might also be contributed to by a decrease in positive feedback from estrogen. The peak of the LH surge takes place right before ovulation. The LH matures the follicle. Elevated FSH levels are thought to free the oocyte from follicular attachments. Proteolytic enzymes, such as collagenase and plasmin, as well as prostaglandins, are activated and digest collagen in the follicular wall. Prostaglandins also stimulate smooth muscles within the ovary, further promoting release of the oocyte. All of this leads to the explosive release of the oocyte cumulus complex. Cumulus cells are specialized granulosa cells that surround an oocyte and ensure healthy oocyte and embryo development. Once the egg is released, rupturing through the ovary wall, it is swept into the fallopian tube by the fimbria, a fringe of tissue along its edge. After a day, an unfertilized egg will disintegrate in the fallopian tube. Now, let's get to the luteal phase. After ovulation, the remaining granulosa cells combine with the theca cells and surrounding stroma in the ovary to become the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is a temporary endocrine organ which predominantly secretes progesterone. It prepares the estrogen-primed endometrium for implantation by a fertilized egg. The progesterone also decreases the frequency of GnRH pulses. The corpus luteum doesn't last long unless the egg is fertilized. Its existence depends on continued LH support. However, the hormones it produces suppress the production of LH and FSH. If implantation doesn't occur within two weeks, it will involute, causing a rapid decline in progesterone and estrogen. If a pregnancy does occur, human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG, is produced by the syncytiotrophoblast, the outer layer of the blastocyst, the embryo-containing structure. The HCG is similar to LH, so it preserves the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum can then keep producing progesterone to support the new pregnancy. Otherwise, estrogen and prostaglandins cause the corpus luteum to undergo luteolysis, and it forms a scar tissue called the corpus albicans. The demise of the corpus luteum means that estrogen and progesterone levels fall, so GnRH pulse frequency begins to increase, starting the follicular phase. Now, let's briefly cover the uterine cycle. First, there's menstruation. Menstrual fluids consist of disquamated endometrial tissue, red blood cells, inflammatory exudates, and proteolytic enzymes. What triggers the shedding of the endometrium? When the corpus luteum disintegrates, there is progesterone withdrawal. This results in coiling and constriction of spiral arterioles in the superficial endometrial layers, which eventually results in ischemia of the tissue due to decreased blood flow. The endometrium then releases prostaglandins due to decreased stability of lysosomal membranes, which cause uterine smooth muscle contractions, and the period begins. About two days after the start of menstruation, estrogen produced by the growing follicles stimulates the generation of a new surface endometrial epithelium. Gradually increasing estrogen concentrations eventually cause the discharge of menses to stop. Then, there's the proliferation phase so-called because estrogen causes the lining of the uterus to grow. Again, 
This estrogen is secreted in increasing amounts as the ovarian follicles mature. A new layer of endometrium, called the proliferative endometrium, is formed. Finally, there is the secretory phase. The corpus luteum produces progesterone, which makes the endometrium receptive to blastocyst implantation. It does this by increasing blood flow and uterine secretions and reducing contractility of the uterus's smooth muscle tissue. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. It would help me make more videos. And make sure to comment with any topics you'd like me to cover in future videos. Also, it would be really nice if you could support me on Patreon. Thank you.